Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining yet another PHS Live on how to collect and preserve and maintain your congregation's records. This webinar is streaming live on Facebook and it's being recorded. So be kind to me. More to the point, we record all of our PHS Lives and then we edit them and repost them on our website. So if you know somebody who can't make it, there will be an opportunity to review this later. I can see participants coming into the chat. Welcome, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to chill here for a little bit before I get going. Glad to see everybody. I see familiar faces, names in the chat. Manly Olson, what's up? Agnes Peebles, ma'am, what's up? I think that's Village Presbyterian Church, Prairie, Prairie Village, Kansas. How are y'all? Good to see everybody. KG saying hi. So that's another reminder. Um, what I really want to do is to talk uh, blessedly briefly, because a lot of this folks have heard before, um, maybe 20 minutes. And then I really want to uh, open up the audience for questions and answers. Um, you have been out in the field dealing with your own records, and I want to hear the um, problems and struggles that you guys have had. Um, one more minor housekeeping thing. You can post questions into the chat in Zoom. You can also, if you're watching live on Facebook, just leave questions in the comments. And our admirable moderator, Kristen Gatos, who's invisible to everyone, I think, uh, will field those from Facebook. So with no further ado, I'm just going to hop in and hide behind a PowerPoint for a second. Help me out. All right, can everybody see a PowerPoint screen? Fantastic, thanks for joining us. This is going to be just kind of a soup to nuts, basic um, chat about maintaining church records. I'm gonna begin with a quick overview of PHS, who we are, how long we've been around and what we do. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about archival appraisal for congregations records. Um, we're going to talk about the ongoing digital paper hybrid environment that we live in. Um, and then we're going to conclude by just talking a little bit about how PHS can help you. Um, so to begin with, if you have not familiarized yourself with the Presbyterian Historical Society in the 169th year of our existence, uh, we are the National Archives of the Peace USA. We serve the records of national agency offices, mid councils, and most significantly right now, uh, congregations. Um, unlike uh, well, we have more than 38,000 cubic feet of original archival material dating back to the very first Presbytery meeting in the uh, North American continent in 1706, um, spanning through the 21st century. We, uh, unlike many archives, we do not have a problem connecting, collecting new material. We bring in more than 500 cubic feet of records every single year the largest tranche of which uh, right now is congregations records. We bring in about 300 feet from 200 historic and current PCUSA congregations every year. Um, and this, I think, has to do with the integral nature of record keeping to the Presbyterian tradition. Um, many of you have probably heard this joke before, but Presbyterians, to my mind, are people of the book. You know, you uh, carry the Bible and the Book of Confessions and the Book of Order and Robert's Rules Revised Third Edition. 
and your responsibility to keep an accurate record of the things that went on before you, as in Luke 1, 1 through 4, uh, is part of your polity. On the left-hand side, you see uh, chapter 20 from the 1789 minutes of the General Assembly. Um, and on the right side, you see books on the shelf in our vault. Um, so we are part of how the church writ large, the connectional church, discharges that responsibility across time. And so if you're here, you have probably asked yourself this question. You've encountered a church basement or an attic or an office or the home of a former clerk of session, and you have found stuff and you have thought, I don't know where to begin. And so the very first task for anybody who wants to work with church records is what we call appraisal. Appraisal is just really quickly the art of separating the wheat from the chaff. Um, on the screen, what you're seeing is a 2013 shipment of records from a little church in Texas uh, who called us up and said, listen, we're a small church. We have been around for 60 years and we're going to close this year and we're going to ship you our whole office. And I said, ma'am, you are not going to do that. And she said, oh, I already have. And so we brought in about 1,300 pounds of records from this one church. On the left, you can see multiple copies of the same, I think, Presbyterian Mariners uh, publication, um, tons and tons of quotidian business files and administrative. So this is something that you do not want to have happen. You do not want to burden others with. What we're trying to do in archives is to make the past easily accessible and easy to interpret. And so the first kind of quick and dirty life hack thing for appraising church records is to identify the bodies that you want to pull out of the wreckage. That means session minutes and registers. For a congregation, these are the essential records of your congregation. Um, without these things, you cannot be said to have existed as an organization session minutes uh, compile all of the actions that you have taken. Um, they bear witness to those actions and registers uh, enumerate the people who have been part of you. Session minutes and registers and then uh, additional kind of records of permanent value um, like minutes of other church groups like trustees, deacons, women's groups. Um, those are all kind of like vital records of the congregation, and those should occupy a, a fairly small piece of real estate. A church that's about 150 years old, has had about 150 members over time, should have about one or two cubic feet of records, of essential records, like two boxes. Anything more than that, and they're probably over-documented. So it should be a very small bucket that you're looking for for vital records to preserve. A much larger bucket is going to be records that are not um, essential to your character, uh, but are um, records of interest. And these are what I kind of think of as commemorative records. So on the screen is uh, a really beautiful 1960s coat of chrome of a proud Girl Scout and her little brother uh, from Bay Ridge United Church in Brooklyn. This was a joint PCUSA RCA church uh, that closed. Their Girl Scouts group had no written records, no registers, no minutes, and the only trace of that kind of social activity was found in photographs and photo albums. And so commemorative records have the capacity to uh, elucidate and uh, to elucidate print records and vital records and to kind of enlighten us about the social history of the organization. Um, on a, a kind of broader note, um, commemorative records, there we go. Sorry, everybody. Uh, commemorative records bear the power to remind. Um, they don't just tell us about the social history of an individual church, but when church records are gathered together as they are in PHS, they obtain power in the aggregate and they tell us the things that 
the whole church has been committed to over time. Um, on the screen, you see an image from the Bohemian Brethren Church of Omaha, Nebraska. This is a children's pageant called the Discovery of the Infant Moses. Um, and the Bohemian Brethren Church is one of many strands of European Protestantism, which got pulled into uh, the old Peace USA over the course of the 20th century. The church has been the home to speakers of Hungarian and Welsh and Czech and Italian and half a dozen other languages. Um, and over the course of the 20th century, you even gathered in language-based presbyteries. I think the last to shut down was possibly the Synod of the Welsh Synod of Pennsylvania, and they only shut down in the late 1950s as kind of assimilation happened. And so these records, these commemorative records, are bearers of Presbyterian witness over the 20th century. Um, the, the work that you have done to ensure that uh, immigrant groups have a place at the table. So two buckets so far, one is vitals, one is commemorative material, and that can be photographs, slides, audio recordings, like old open reel tapes, which is my favorite, uh, motion pictures and video recordings, photograph albums. Um, that is a slightly bigger bucket. The third bucket and the largest uh, of the kinds of material that ordinary congregations create is actually records that are only of temporary value. Um, the kind of records of uh, administration and daily business within the church. And these are things that can be set aside for a period of time and eventually records managed out, i.e. shredded. Um, we have an extensive records retention schedule on our website. Uh, we have, we're gonna give you links to everything uh, later on. Um, that retention schedule classes kinds of records in an extremely narrow and detailed way. Um, the kind of ballpark idea for most administrative records of a church is you're going to want to keep most financial records for seven years, right? This is the period of time during which uh, an organization can be audited. The majority of records that are older than seven years, the majority of financial records anyway, that are older than seven years, are things that can be records managed out. Everything has a, a function, and the function of daily or administrative records is to keep the church moving, not to necessarily bear witness to the ideas and mission of the church. David, you just said shred. What do you mean? Are you saying I should use paper for permanent records? Yes, yes I am. Paper is the cheapest long-term stable bearer of text that we know of. If all you want to do is to maintain a text so that other people can read it, acid-free paper is going to persist for at least a century in really good conditions, possibly 500 years. Um, paper, committing records to paper, also bears the added benefit of having inbuilt security. Um, paper records are uh, not impossible to forge, but they're a little more difficult to forge than born digital material, they're more difficult to edit. And most importantly, it's very easy to like create bearers of authenticity on top of paper records. And so on the screen, what you see are some of the markers of authenticity of a piece of minutes. You have the signature of a clerk of session, you have the stamp of a middle governing body, you have dates, you have the signature of the moderator of the governing body. And so Paper bears with it physical traces of its authenticity as a document. Elsewhere on the screen, uh, what I, what's here is uh, 
a package of minutes from a church in, uh, in the St. Louis area, which had a really robust run of minutes from about 1880 until about 2000. And the only chunk of minutes that was not immediately visible uh, was minutes from the 1990s. And so on the screen, you have the floppy disk that uh, had, I guess, 1994's minutes, actually, 94, um, stuck together with rubber bands. Um, this turned out to be, at first, not legible, because uh, floppy disk to USB drives are kind of wonky to read. Um, and then finally legible, and what's on the right side is the list of files that spun off of that disk. Um, evidently, the clerk had one file, at least one file. What I'm looking at is 02-16-12, 02-16-34. So like multiple tiny files for individual session minutes. Um, what we're trying to do when we preserve things for the long haul is to reduce the technical dependencies between us and the reader. If you have paper and a source of light, the only technical dependency apart from that is a capacity to read the language that the text is in. If you have a floppy disk, the technical dependencies that I encountered were uh, hardware. I needed a floppy disk drive, uh, software to read, a, read the file formats. So PWP, I think it's like Pro, Power Writer Pro or something. Some, esoteric, arcane, uh, uh, proprietary format of text, which it turned out was not really well legible in Word. We got a bunch of ASCII um, extra characters and garbage. Um, so there are hardware and then software and then migration dependencies. If I could have read the PWP files, uh, we would have then had to, uh, I guess, from a file that could read, we would have had to write to those files, write to new files that we would then have to carry forward um, as Word or PDF. So we're trying to limit the technical dependencies between creation and reading. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship between a, a church register and a church membership management system. Um, here kind of clumsily abbreviated to CMS. Um, what's on the screen is uh, a church register from Mother Bethel AME, our neighbor, who, some of whose registers uh, and other minutes we digitized uh, last year as part of a grant funded project. Um, and on the screen, what you see is the marriage register from a couple of months in 1885. Um, we occasionally get asked, look, we have a church membership management system um, and it has a ton of functionality. And we, because we have this thing that has a ton of functionality, we don't think that we need uh, a paper register. Um, what is that for? It's worth thinking about the different functions that a church register and a church membership management system provide. Um, in addition to being uh, stable over the long haul and bearing traces of its own authenticity and removing uh, technical dependencies, um, a paper register is information dense. That is a single entry, like the double page image in front of you, carries information for multiple people at a time. Um, by contrast, this is the individual entry panel for, I think, Servant Keeper 8. And it bears a ton of information, you know, designed in a graphical interface to um, allow you to make individual ticks and toggles to what basically ends up being a line in an Excel spreadsheet or a table. Um, the church membership management system is something that is, you know, immensely useful for administrators in terms of keeping in touch with congregants and keeping track of monetary donations and um, just kind of 
shepherding the the flock at hand and those are all like daily business uses that are of immense value uh in the day-to-day -day period but a church membership management system um has added information that does not need to be maintained for the long haul at all it has email addresses and multiple telephone numbers and mm, hopefully not social security numbers but there's a ton of stuff in those things that does not mean need to be maintained for the long haul um, so what we recommend and this is true of session minutes as well we recommend that you're going to end up living in a hybrid digital and paper environment for the foreseeable future you know it was more than 40 years ago that the end of the paper-based office uh, was heralded in an in a, uh, issue of Business Week. Um, it's been 45 years and we have still not gotten there. Um, and so dealing with session minutes, the best path forward that we have seen is to maintain them first in PDF and then print your PDFs to acid-free paper, store that in a folder or a binder in a box, uh, in a place that's away from heat, light, and water. Um, you can then do with your PDFs as you see fit. You can publish them on your own web page. You can store them in your own um, uh, local network, local device, removable hard drive, or um, elsewhere on the cloud. Um, likewise with church registers and church membership management systems, for CMSs, it's a wise idea if there isn't already kind of built into your program a cloud backup, it's probably a wise idea to be able to spit out the whole contents of your database to a CSV file or a TSV file or an XML file probably once a year, um, just so that the basic idea is no matter what system you use to input data, make sure that you can get uh, a legible output of that same data. Um, and then the second half of that hybrid program is to actually create and enter um, membership information in a paper register, something that will actually persist for sure for the next hundred years. I skipped over a, another little tidbit, but this is a tidbit that I love. Um, so what I see in a church membership management system is actually uh, another 20th century invention, the index card. Um, this is my way of kind of reminding myself and others that not every in innovation in technology is an, in a an advance in learning. Not every innovation advances learning. Um, what we see on the screen is the church register for a really large, really rich church in Chicago. Um, and they encountered a problem with the classic 19th century register. Um, it's that it is not extensible. If you get really big as a church, you need something that is going to be infinitely expandable. And that's the kind of thing that an index card system offers. Uh, the index card system while offering infinite extensibility introduces other problems there is no way for example to aggregate data out of an index card system you can't get a full date range you can't get a full date range for everybody whose last name begins with a t unless you separately tabulate that data um, and in the present day um, one of the difficulties that we encounter is with digitizing index card collections. What we end up with is uh, every single image bearing information for one individual rather than every image, as in a church register, bearing information for like 50 individuals. We lose information density. You did not expect that this was going to be a lecture about the index card system, but there we are something new every day. How can PHS help me with my church records? The 
very first and the classic way that we can help you with your church records is by taking original minutes and registers on deposit. We'll bring in session minutes, registers, trustees, deacons, women's groups. We will bring in the batch of commemorative records that you create. Um, we store them in a secure climate controlled environment. Uh, we write database records that are then public so that anybody can figure out that you exist and anybody can view records that are older than 50 years. We have a blanket 50 year embargo on congregations records in order to kind of blanket safeguard the privacy of individuals. Anything older than that is open to the general public. And so your records join a great cloud of witnesses uh, to the tune of something like 12,000 other congregations. We can help you via digitizing your church records. Um, in this way, you can have uh, a reliable surrogate of your records uh, to refer to in PDF, PFA format um, while making sure that the physical original substrate is secure elsewhere. We image more than 70,000 pages of text for congregations every single year. Um, depositing records with us is a free service. You have basically paid for that via per capita. And so you should take us up on that service. Digitization uh, is, uh, is a paid service. We image records at 60 cents per page. And then we deliver to you PDFA output one file for every volume of minutes. That is all of my contact information. If you have any questions ever about deposit and digitization, give me a shout, send me an email. We'll post this stuff in the chat as well. And then I can stop sharing and start um, taking questions if everybody's cool with that. And there we go. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Bob and Elena. They were um, wondering if you could talk about converting handwritten documents into OCR searchable text. I sure can. Uh, the short answer is that uh, there's no such thing. I'm going to pause a second because I'm going to drink some water and leap into it. So uh, machine learning in the last maybe 10 years has made incredible strides in voice recognition and in audio transcription. Um, maybe seven years ago, we had really, really crummy voice recognition and audio transcription via computer. Um, and that has changed by leaps and bounds. But the idea that there is optical character recognition, which is what was meant by OCR, uh, the idea that there's optical character recognition for handwritten texts is still uh, like way, way distant. There is a long-term effort, uh, and I can probably find the links if I search, but there's a long-term effort, uh, I think, at Cambridge to, um, to mark up the digitized notebooks of Jeremy Bentham um, and by, they basically have a horde of uh, students and interns looking at Bentham's manuscripts and dragging boxes over individual letters and individual words, and then keying in the text for those boxes, um, and then feeding that information into a machine learning program, which then tries to predict what Bentham's handwritten text looks like in another book. That is like, 10 year long project uh, so far for the handwriting of one individual Englishman. So we are likely to make additional progress on um, handwritten text and character recognition for handwritten text um, in the future, uh, but it is it has been a long slog. And uh, the majority of the texts that we do see that have um, searchable handwritten text that is entirely piecework done by humans. 
it is 100% piecework done by humans. Um, this is kind of an example of what other people in other disciplines have called photomation. So faux automation, something that looks like it was done by a machine, but was actually in most cases done by extremely poorly paid people in like China and the Philippines. Thank you so much for this question. Can you tell that I enjoyed this question? We had a couple of people ask about what the best way to ship records to PHS is, especially um, older records that are more fragile. Absolutely. We rely on UPS as shipper, as shipper of choice. Um, the best thing you can do is to identify all your volumes and kind of wrap them in either newsprint or bubble wrap and put that into a sturdy corrugated cardboard box. Um, tape up the box real well and ship by UPS. Somebody asked us to repeat, not every innovation advances fill in the blank. I would invite you to fill in the blank. I think there's a lot of uh, human endeavors where that's true, but all I was saying was uh, not every innovation advances learning. Do we have any more questions? I'm scrolling in the chat too. Um, if our records were microfilmed years ago by your office, what is the status? Great question. For about 60 years, we had a really extensive microfilming program here. We originally subcontracted out to two different microfilm entities that worked in Philadelphia. Globe Microfilm was one of them. Um, and so for about 60 years until 2014, that was how we did that work. If you had records microfilmed with us, we have in all likelihood in the 99% of all cases, uh, we have the negative and the positive of that film and we can create digital images from that film. In many cases, congregations opted to deposit records with us. So we also have the originals in all likelihood. And so if we have access to originals, um, we can create digital images from the originals. Those will be full color. They're gonna be higher resolution than microfilm will be. Um, and with color and a higher resolution, we'll have a better OCR for uh, typewritten text. I was, uh, I was, you know, kind of digging at uh, OCR for handwritten text earlier in the chat, but uh, OCR for typewritten text, um, again, is not perfect, but it is immensely uh, more reliable than a handwritten text. And everything that we digitize, we do really extensive quality assurance and quality control. Um, it takes about an hour for us to shoot about 300 pages of text. Uh, we spend between three and five hours for every 300 pages of text in quality assurance control, and that includes uh, optical character recognition. Um, John was wondering if laser printing on acid-free paper is the correct combination to preserve records. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. We can go really way down a rabbit hole about inks and papers. The reality is that you're likeliest to have uh, laser printing or xerographic printing at your disposal, and that's just what you're going to get. If we were creating artworks on paper from a computer, we would use acid-free soy-based ink out of a high-end inkjet. Uh, but What's on the market now are by and large not great inkjets. And so laser paper, uh, laser toner on acid-free paper is fine. One of the things that we've run into is there's different kinds of acid-free paper. You can make a wood pulp paper acid-free if you imbue it with chalk. If you like just add a bunch of chalk to the pulp, that will uh, change the pH of the paper. You can also get paper that is natively acid-free, as in it's not 
made from wood pulp, it's made from cotton. Um, that paper is vastly more expensive, um, but it obviates some of the very slight problems that happen when you use xerographic toner on something that has a lot of chalk. This is all like the biggest possible preservation picture is get it onto paper. The smaller one is get it into something that is not a vinyl binder. Um, vinyl binders off gas, um, uh, something that is a solvent of xerographic toner. And that's why when you encounter a vinyl binder from the 1990s, you see pages that are all stuck together because the off gassing from the, bin from the binder has caused the layers of toner to re, uh, you know, dissolve and stick to one another. Um, Forest Hills Presbyterian Church was wondering if you recommend keeping or not keeping worship bulletins. Uh, most bulletins do not differ that much week to week or church to church. Um, so for our purposes, the most important records are session minutes and registers. There are a lot of folks who kind of use bulletins more like a newsletter. Um, and so that may become a more commemorative use and that may find usefulness at the local church level. We don't bring them in, but if you have a record that serves a need for your, for your congregation, then that's something that you should hang on to. Um, I have one in the chat. So uh, someone has asked, uh, what do we do with all the, the genealogists barking down our door? Um, one of the great things about depositing records with PHS is that you can direct genealogists to contact us directly. Uh, we have a dedicated staff of archivists who specialize in reference replies. Um, you can tell anybody who wants to know something about your church to just email refdesk at history.pcusa.org, refdesk at history.pcusa.org. Um, we feel more than 3,000 requests uh, from patrons every single year. Um, a big plurality of those are genealogists, maybe 30 to 35%. Um, so we can handle those requests and that way your church administrator uh, or your clerk of session does not have to handle those requests. And you can be about the business of your church. How should books be uh, labeled for dates and um, with paper inside the box listing years of book with a paper inside the box listing years of book included, I guess when they're being shipped to PHS. Oh, if, if this is a shipping question, doesn't even matter. Uh, you know, we are really adept and one of the, uh, one of the things that happens when we first open up a box is we identify the kind of thing it is and what its dates are. Um, so when presbyteries, for instance, have a bunch of records of closed churches, my only appeal to them is just leave a note in the box for which church it is. And then beyond that, we can totally figure it out. Don't worry about labeling. David, can you talk a little bit about how people can find out if their records are at, if their church records are at PHS? Absolutely. It's gonna mean typing, which means I'm gonna be a little slow, sorry. Uh, the one place to search is our library catalog. Um, this is kind of, a remnant of the days when all we had was a library catalog for archival description. Um, and so we dumped a bunch of archival description into it. That is catalog.history. Told you the typing would be bad. This guy thinks he's so smart, but he can't spell. Catalog.history.pcusa.org. That's Calvin. Um, that has um, the majority of the records that we got uh, between like 1967 and maybe 2017. The other place to look is elsewhere on our website, which is just 
history.peaceusa.org, you'll see links to our archives database, which is called Shepherd. Um, and there are congregation records inside of Shepherd. We have a ton of FAQs on the website. There are videos to guide you in how to search those databases. And if all else fails and you can't make head nor hair of the databases, you can still just email us to confirm whether we have stuff for you. Great and frequent question about uh, Southern Stream of the Church. How many of the PCUS records from Montreat do you have? So for anybody who's uh, fresh to the denomination or fresh to the chat, uh, once upon a time, the PCUSA ran two archives. These were historically the archives of the PCUS, the kind of Southern Stream of the Church, and then the archives of the Northern Stream of the Church, the old PCUSA, later the UPCUSA. Uh, Southern Church records were in Montreat, North Carolina from the 1940s until 2006. It was 2003 when the General Assembly um, did the last little bit of reunion and it, it was to merge your two archives. Um, and between 2003 and 2006, PHS staff uh, worked assiduously um, to figure out where things uh, should go. And so because we hold records on deposit for congregations, we don't claim to own them outright. Congregations continue to own them. Uh, we wrote to every congregation that had records in Montreat and said, you have multiple choices. Your records are welcome in Philadelphia. If not Philadelphia, you can get them returned to the congregation. Uh, if you don't want to do that, sorry, we're open to uh, having them sent to any uh, Presbyterian seminary of your choice. And so a small amount of records went back to Austin Theological Seminary. A small number went to Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. Um, and another portion uh, came here. In addition to that, the entirety of national level PCUS and synod level PS, PCUS and virtually all of the presbyteries except for like Atlanta region presbyteries uh, came here. Um, we have a question about the difference between annual reports and session minutes. Um, and your annual reports indicate what has been done. Session min minutes indicate what session hoped to happen. So annual reports to some degree are better. Annual membership directories show members, um, members of their households and mm -hmm. sometimes strongly uh, connect to people who are not members. This is somewhat more inclusive um, than the traditional register and session minutes. Uh, do you accept those two types of records? We do. If you go to our website and look at the uh, records retention schedule, you'll see annual reports and directories uh, classed as permanent. Uh, what format does PHS use to save records? In other words, what will the local church see when you mail back the digital copy? What you'll see uh, when we image records for you is a PDF A document. That's a regular PDF, uh, just a subset of the standard slash A for archival, um, which limits the amount of things that the document can do, which makes it easier to preserve over the long haul. So you'll see PDFA um, and you'll have one multi-page PDF document uh, per volume of text. Um, how do we handle records in languages other than English? That's an amazing question. We do exactly the same thing as we do with English records. Um, we, I would be hard pressed to think of an instance where we tried to OCR typewritten text in a non-English language. I think this is another, I know for a fact that this is an ongoing struggle for archives in the English world um, because as, you know, kind of speakers of, you know, an emerging lingua franca, um, English speakers are remarkably monolingual. And so we anticipate that we are going to be able to read any text at hand. Um, one of the things that we've learned recently is that 
um, we are always learning things that we did not know that we did not know. Um, in the last year, year and a half, we imaged a bunch of records from the Abay mission station um, in Lebanon from the 1840s to like the 1860s. This is a really, and it, a period of intensity um, in the lives of people in Mount Lebanon. Um, and the records were described in our finding aid as being in Arabic. Um, and a portion of that little chunk were, but um, the larger portion were in Ottoman Turkish. So not even, not modern Turkish, of course, but Ottoman Turkish. We didn't know that that was the case until we imaged the records and put them in the hands of scholars of the area who were able to identify the scripts and tell us what they were. Um, this is all by way of saying that even if we can't read the scripts as archivists, the best thing that we can do is to digitize the stuff and get it into the hands of people who can actually read the script. Um, if a church has records that are not on acid-free paper, should they copy them first before sending them to PHS? Uh, I wouldn't go to that length. We kind of rely on um, records being in as close to their original state as possible. Um, and if a piece of acid-free text is kept in uh, reliable archival conditions, it's going to slow the hydrolysis of the acid, right? As water vapor enters a piece of paper, um, it produces acid over time. And if you have things at a stable humidity within a couple of percentage points of 50% relative humidity. And if you have things that are stable at 65 degrees Fahrenheit, um, even if they're acidic, they're gonna have a pretty long lifespan. And we value seeing things in their original form so that we can confirm that they are what they purport to be. So that's kind of where we land on original stuff. Um, what should a family do with ragged pages missing, torn um, Bibles that have family registers uh, written into them? That's a great question. Um, uh, I, I think the short answer is it's none of my business. <laughs> it's, it's your family's Bible and you're entitled to do with it as you see fit. Um, Bibles are not consecrated objects, right? The object itself is uh, not consecrated, so there's no harm, no foul in uh, doing with the Bible as you see fit. If you have uh, the need to remove the good pages of family history out of an ancient illegible Bible, then you should do that and preserve those pieces of text. Uh, what about old family Bibles that are given to churches to keep? I hate to tell you that that might be up to you. It's none of my business. We very frequently hear from churches who have, like for instance, old pulpit Bibles. A lot of times a congregation will close and they'll have five or six 19th or 20th century, you know, super large pulpit Bibles. And those are not records. You know, a record is something that is a unique trace of an event that happened. A pulpit Bible is a publication and they published hundreds of thousands and millions of them. Um, so they're not innately valuable in themselves. If they carry records that are of interest to the congregation, um, then you might try and find a way to carry on the parts of that Bible that have like documentary value. Um, if a church has original minutes from the 1950s to the present, uh, how many decades should be sent to PHS? Oh, that's a great question. You should only send to us records that you're unlikely to need to read. Um, for most folks, and this is kind of where I rely on the idea of keeping a physical binder of minutes, for most people, the active binder of minutes, or maybe the one before that, should definitely stay at the church. 
Um, but it's very rare for folks to need to get deep into anything older than about 25 years very frequently. Now, if you do send material here, um, it's not inaccessible to you. In fact, it's possibly more accessible than it was before because it's going to have better description. You can ask us to selectively image records. Um, and if it's not too much digitization, we'll do like a few pages for free. Um, you can ask us questions about your own records, same as the reference request above. Um, and if you're doing like a deep dive into your own history for an anniversary or something, um, you can uh, have records sent back to the church just with a note from the clerk of session and we'll ship them right back to you. Um, do you recommend a certain type of binder or a certain type of way to save uh, paper minutes? Uh, no, I don't. There's uh, a long relationship between the Presbyterian Church and Cokesbury, but there's nothing in the Book of Order that says you have to have a Cokesbury binder. Um, so no, a, an acid-free folder is pretty useful. Um, and keeping records like at the back of a closet on the first floor of a church office building is a perfectly fine way to store them. Um, there was a question earlier about minutes being microfilmed and uh, Michelle was wondering if there is any recommended microfilm reader out there, um, maybe for congregations. No, I mean, by and large, um, unless you have a functional one at your public library, if your public library has like a genealogy room with a functional microfilm reader, that's going to be your opportunity to read microfilm. Um, but at this point, uh, your best path forward if you have microfilm is to go and get it digitized. And there are vendors online who will digitize, you know, a reel at a time for you. I think we have time for a few more questions. Does anybody have any lingering questions? I have a question from a researcher from Brazil. Hi, Jardé, how you doing? Um, uh, Jardé's question is, uh, he was a researcher in 2013. Uh, I think we he filled out a survey maybe by email. Um, he's asking how his research is filed. Um, we keep um, some records of researchers and we are always eager to uh, obtain the published material that a researcher creates out of their research here. So we have a whole host of books created by people who've done research here. Um, but the kind of individual information that people fill out at the desk, um, we keep for a period of time um, and then discard. I'm not sure I did a great job with your question, Jardé. If you have other questions, please email me. We can get deeper into it. Uh, can people drop off records in person instead of using UPS? 100%. If you're close to Philadelphia, you're welcome to visit us uh, to drop off records. We, If you look at my Twitter feed, you will see that we got drop offs just the other day. So we'll meet you in the inner parking lot and put stuff on our freight elevator and cart it to the basement. And we're just getting praise from Village. Thank you so much, Village. Inshallah, we'll be able to see you sometime. Um, an anonymous attendee was wondering if we'd like periodic historical booklets created for church celebrations. That is the kind of thing that, that we bring into, um, particularly if you have like a 50th anniversary or a 100th anniversary, we'll bring in those publications as well. There's a lot of 
Thank yous coming in. A lot of thank yous, Haven. guys. Gosh. Wow. <laughs> Must have done okay. Well, I hope this has been, yeah, I hope this has been a pleasure for everybody. I appreciate the, the thanks. And again, email me with any questions. If you want uh, the a more substantial text uh, that accompanied my slides, I can send those along. And of course, this is being recorded and will be up on our website, you know, within the next few weeks for anybody who missed it. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks so much to Kristen for moderating. Thanks to everybody who attended. I see 77 people on Zoom and there's probably a host more on Facebook Live, which is superb. Thanks everybody. Have a nice rest of your week and a good weekend. Peace.